Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. All right, so um, I, I've, I've told you before in various, um, in various ways that um, uh, most often in ministry I feel like a passenger when it comes to um, what to talk about and what to say about that subject matter um, because I, um, as I've said to you before, I most often feel that I haven't chosen the, the message but the message has chosen me and that my uh, role is simply to be obedient to, to what it is that I believe God has put in my heart uh, as, a word, as a word for us and, and, and for you. So, uh, this, I, I had a thought that I was wrestling with this week that was just a minor part of this, but it's like the thing took on a life of its own, and I, I just feel this is what uh, I need to talk to you about tonight. I, I, believe that it's, um, I believe that it follows on from what Chris and Jenny talked about last week, um, and we, in leaders this week, were laughing because it had become the age of aquarium. Um, Pisces has escaped. We still have the aquarium. We're in the age of aquarium, which some of you don't find that funny because you haven't got the same sense of humor as me, but I think it's hilarious. Um, anyway, um, if you haven't heard what Chris and Jenny talked about last week, I highly recommend get online, listen to it. It was absolutely excellent about an assessment of, of how... Um, the mentality of humanity is being shaped and where we actually are now in that, in the context of that, in a world view. Um, in, in, in light of that, I want to talk to you tonight about the wisdom of wisdom. Uh, wisdom is, is, it's a wonderful thing, but it's not always common. We regularly confuse knowledge with wisdom. If I know stuff, then I'm wise. But um, I would echo what uh, Chris brought out last week, that in this, in this age that we live in now, where it, it used to be, you know, um, to be or not to be, which was to do with you needed a faith and a belief to discover things and stuff, that now it becomes this age of, of be to be, which is a very introverted, actually very self-centered process that, you know, I am me and, and I am in control of me and I am all that I will ever be and leave me the heck alone. Um, you know, leave me, leave me be because, you know, um, I be to be. Uh, one of the things she did mention, which is statistically true, is that with all that we think is our advancement into personal development, the suicide rates in the world are higher than they've ever been. The rates of people addicted, the rates of people in trouble are higher than they've ever been. So whatever it is that we have thought is the answer in our individualism and in our individual freedom actually has not produced any solution truly for life. Um, it, 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 is a, it is a temporal um, thing that is expressed in the wider process of life, buy now, pay later. And so we have a greater level of indebtedness than we've ever had because we're a buy now, pay later. We think, I'll just do it now and I'll think about what this is going to cost me later. And of course, uh, ultimately, um, society will and, and has to a degree, turn, it turns in on itself uh, because if everybody's only interested in themselves, then ultimately nothing can succeed. It's like a black hole that sucks everything in. And within all that, we have to have in life, life requires this thing called wisdom. And, and the Bible talks quite a lot about wisdom, particularly back in the book of Proverbs and, and the book of Ecclesiastes, who, who for most part of the same author, talk about the, the necessity of wisdom. What is wisdom? Making wise, not just making decisions, but making wise decisions. 
not just doing stuff, but doing things wisely are a, a lifesaver and a help. So let, let me just run you through a few, a few verses um, that I pulled out of the book of Proverbs. Uh, a few comments on these, then I'll, I'll explain a little more about this whole thing of, of wisdom. So, so let me run through a few verses. Proverbs 3 verse 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Or in other words, wisdom is not something that you self-determine. Right? When you start to believe that you're incredibly wise, you just revealed that you're not. Now, we might not use that terminology. We might, we might skip that terminology. But, but when we start to come to the thing of, I always know best, and my decisions will always be without flaws, we're in trouble. That's what he means. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Now, that's whole terminology, and some of you won't grasp that and get scared by it. But what he really means is that where wisdom in your own eyes is going to leave you is somewhere that you had better not be. Okay? So we depart from that place, uh, and God's got to play a part in that. Proverbs 12, verse 15. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes. So we're back again to this problem that if I measure myself against myself, uh, more often than not, the decisions that I make I will always deem to have been the right decision because I'm not going to say to myself, oh, you made the wrong decision. I'm going to say to myself, it's the right decision, it's just everybody else that doesn't understand. It's everybody else that's reading you wrong. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes. But listen, but he who heeds counsel is wise. We are generationally in a place where we don't readily listen to what other people will tell us as advice in our situation. And let me add into that, even often what God is trying to tell us, we won't heed wise counsel. Proverbs 16 verse 2. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes. Uh, these are all, see, these are all about, in our self-wisdom, how we measure ourselves is very rarely accurate and true. Now, you ought to know me by now, some of you have never heard me, some of you have never met me, but those of you who do know me, that I'm not, I'm not you know, one of these condemning, uh, accusing type of people, you know, who believe that, that, that we are, that, that man is, is inherently evil. I don't believe that at all. Um... But I do know enough to know that, that we always think that, that what we're doing is okay when it's measured in our own eyes. All the ways of man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirits. Proverbs 21, 2 is similar. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the hearts. So the real lesson here is that wisdom demands that you take measurements outside of yourself. Because those measurements can work two ways. Those measurements will either leave you with an over-exaggerated view of yourself. You know, you'll come out of it thinking, I'm just so flipping amazing. I just, I can hardly bear to live with myself because I'm so perfect and brilliant. Or it will leave you with a self-condemning view of yourself that says, oh, I'm just rubbish. I'm just terrible. I'm not good enough. I'll never be good enough. So without external wisdom, self-examination only can ever take us so far, and that is to realize we need something outside ourselves. Now, I believe the first go to place is, is not what I think about me, but what does God think about me? And what God thinks about you is actually wonderful. He actually likes you. He thinks you're amazing, and he's desperate to be fully involved in your life, but also other people are important as well. I thank God for people in my life. Um, I can't see God. I wish I could. Um, so very often God speaks to me through people because that's the mouth that he uses. That's the love that he shows. Those are the hands and the arms that he uses. And if we dismiss the importance of people in the context of our life, then we are going to miss much of the impartation of God's wisdom into our life. So the, every one man seems right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. Now, like this, Proverbs 26, verse 5, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. In other words, and, and I'm not good at this, 
Tell a fool you're stupid, your decision's stupid, you're being a complete idiot and this is going to destroy you because if you don't, he'll be wise in his own eyes. I'm not very good at that. I, I'm, I don't like confrontation. So some of you, I'm thinking that's really stupid. I apologize and I, I don't always say that's really stupid. You're being so dumb making that decision. And the problem is I've got to repent of that because you might feel the same with me. You might feel, and the times I want to tell you, you're really stupid. What, what happens when that doesn't occur is we become wise in our own eyes because nobody's telling us that's dumb, that's daft, that's ridiculous. This is where that leads. This is what will occur. Now, that is in both ways that sometimes to help us in the wisdom to build, but very often what that's dealing with is the fact that when we are acting foolishly, to have no one say to us, to our face, very clearly, how we are acting is not actually being kind. It's being unkind because you're going to think this was wise. They're the ones with the problem, not me. But how many of you know often we have, we have a problem and we are the problem and it helps to recognize that and be told that so that we can do something about it. Okay, verse, uh, Proverbs 26, verse 12. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There's lots of these out there about, about the danger of being wise in our own eyes. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. In other words, it's actually very dangerous for us to only accumulate wisdom from within our own small space of experience and understanding. We, we have to glean it from outside of that. We have to open ourselves up to a bigger field of wisdom from people, from, from learning, from education, from things that challenge us, and from God himself. But if we're wise in our own eyes, there's more hope than a fool than for us. Two more. Proverbs 26, verse 16. The lazy man is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. Now, that means that, and, and it happens sometimes in here, that, that we're too lazy to check something out, we're too lazy to investigate something, we're too lazy to learn something, we're too lazy to research something. And the problem is that we, we think we know more than the seven people who can answer sensibly. Um, because we, it's, that's, that's a message about the lack of wisdom that is not open to those who have researched something and looked at something and produced something and examined something to contribute into our lives that we were too lazy to do. But if we're only that in our own eyes, then the truth is we'll never have the wisdom of wisdom. Last one of these, Proverbs 28, verse 11. The rich man is wise in his own eyes. This is a great danger of... Because riches are often associated with some kind of success in business or at work or whatever. And uh, the Bible talks a lot about the danger of riches. Now, I'm not against riches. I think, I think it's God's desire and heart that we should prosper uh, and that we should have enough to live and enough to give, is my belief about prosperity. It's when God brings you to a place you have enough to live and enough to give is a place of prosperity. Uh, it's not about amount. Um, the problem is that riches can be very deceiving in that in attaining riches, you can believe you're just so incredibly wise that you attain these riches. You just might be good at something. Uh, and if you're good at it, you'll succeed at it. But don't fool yourself into thinking just because you're good and you have a skill at that, that that makes you incredibly wise. It just means that you're good at what you do and some things happen to produce money. Uh, but I like this. The rich man is wise in his own eyes, but the poor who has understanding searches him out. Or I put the word susses him out. So the poor man with understanding susses out that you might have lots of money, but that doesn't mean you've got lots of wisdom. It can also mean to people like me, you might have position, but it doesn't mean you've got lots of wisdom. You know, you might have success in a field, but it doesn't mean you've got lots of wisdom. You have to find the wisdom for what it is. The wisdom is not measured by position or riches or wealth. It's actually measured by ultimately what comes out of the mouth that brings into your life something that can bring correction, help, change, direction, and, uh, and release you into what is the fruit of wisdom, which is always a, a place of blessing and success. So having said those, just to set the scene, uh, let me talk for a few minutes and try and define some of these things, because uh, I believe there was an age 
uh, where wise men and women were actually valued for their wisdom and that wisdom was sought. And uh, I think we've lost something in the context of society on that level that, that, that the idea of actually seeking out someone who you have seen to have some wisdom in their life and actually bringing your life to a point where you're willing to listen to what they have to say rather than them listen to what you want to tell them. See, I've had many people come to me in council who've said, um, um, I have decided to do this and it's happening then, what do you think about it? Well, you're not interested what I think about it. Because you've already decided to do it and made the arrangements and it's going to happen. So your question to me is actually patronizing when you say, what do you think about it? I know what's being looked for, my approval to say, I approve, so that then you can say, it was approved, but I never had the chance to disapprove because the decision was already made. And, and, and far too infrequently, we ask help, and far too frequently we make decisions without getting alongside somebody and, and maybe even having a little conversation with God about what should be the, the forward momentum. A lot of it we're afraid of the conversation because we know what we want and we're afraid that we might not get what we want or that we might not hear what we want to hear. But that shows the lack of wisdom on your part and my part. Because wisdom would say, if there's something that needs to be said that I might not like, then I would rather hear it and make the decision in light of that than go ahead. So, so all of this is pulling us away from this age of aquarium uh, B2B mentality that brings us back to what is a greater perspective of, of not only community, but, but, but kingdom, God's kingdom community. Now, the sad thing is that not only have we not sought people who we think have wisdom, but we have replaced those people of wisdom by social media platforms. If I can Google it, I'll have everything I need to know. If I can find something on Facebook... You know, if, 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 if it's in Wikipedia, if the, if the answer's in Wikipedia, um, then there's all the wisdom that I need for life. And so we have actually replaced the real source of wisdom, which is people and God, and God's heart in people, with an with a, with a impersonal social media presentation. How many of you know you can find on social media, for any decision you wish to make, all the support you ever dreamed of, all the confirmation you ever desired, all the information you ever wanted on that to say, this is okay, you ought to go ahead and do it, and if anybody tries to stop you, they're being un not politically correct, or they're being obstructive, or they don't care, or they don't love you, or they're prejudiced, or they're racist, because we find the information that we want, and we sift out that information. So, so that's not where wisdom is found. It's where information is found, but don't confuse information with wisdom. Okay? If you hear nothing else tonight but that, it will help you. Don't confuse information with wisdom. The information can lead you in the wrong direction. Information is not wisdom. Now, here's another statement I wanted to make. Third-party information is never a replacement for first-party wisdom. Do you understand what I mean by that? Third-party information, the Googles, the, the news media, you know, the Facebooks, the Twitters, the Instagrams, third-party information is never a replacement for first-party wisdom. First-party wisdom is when we, we, I believe, first we, we talk to God, and then we talk to people who we know love God and care about us, and we talk first-party wisdom is very important, but most of us are living by third-party information. Is that, would that be true? Now, let me also say this, especially for those of you studying, you know, and, and doing great and wonderful, and, and we're at Connie's graduation next week, um, but education and intelligence are two different things, okay? Um, and the problem is that sometimes in our education system, and I've gone through the education system, uh, we, we educate people beyond their intelligence, and so, so people think they're intelligent because they have an education. But education doesn't mean you're intelligent. So you can be educated and make dumb decisions because intelligence is what you need for the decisions. Education is what you need for the information. Okay? 
And the problem is that sometimes education and intelligence are not mutually compatible. Because education can make us think if we have the information, we have the solution. But actually, no, solutions come from intelligence. And intelligence with education is good. I believe in education. I think you guys should get as much education as you can, uh, both formally and informally. Get educated, but understand that does not make you intelligent. But if you combine intelligence with education, uh, with you, that's intelligence with information, then you have a possibility of realizing that you can grab some wisdom that will help you to change you and change the world. Um, so, the role and importance of understanding. This is a critical word, understanding. The role and importance of understanding in, in the gaining of wisdom is something that we all need to grasp. Understanding. Understanding. Very, very important. There's a verse in the Bible that says, the entrance of your word gives light and brings understanding. The important part of that is the understanding. If you don't have any understanding when you come out of it, you're probably not going to be able to grasp any wisdom because you won't understand about yourself or the situation or about the word that you're receiving to help you in that situation. So, a little story, okay? Um, me and Riley are very close and... Uh, he, he, he makes me laugh, he's a hoot. But um, we, we were going out in the rain one day, and of course I got out the receptacle that you would use to go out in the rain, and uh, um, Riley asked what it was, and I said an umbrella, and ever from that day, he's called it an underbrella. So... To Riley, it's an umbrella. Now, I, I always now, our guys will tell you, whenever I go out and get one of those things, I now call it an umbrella, Because I think, that's a great description of what this is. It's an umbrella. If you're not under the brella, then the brella's not going to do much brellering for you. So, so there was a wisdom, there was a wisdom, a childlike wisdom, when Riley looked at that, umbrella meant nothing to him. Now, actually, umbrella comes from, it comes from a, uh, um, uh, a Latin word that, that means shade. But, of course, that means nothing to Riley. What he wanted to look at was the situation and give a, a, a definition according to the situation that he saw. So, umbrella was meaningless to him, but underbrella made sense to him. That's a lesson in childlike wisdom. The childlike wisdom that recognizes what needs to be said and how when that is said, it perfectly describes not only what the situation is, but what you need to do to take advantage of the situation. So I make sure now I go around under the brella whenever it's raining so I get the benefit of the brella, but I only get the benefit of the brella because I'm under it. Now, can you see where we're going a little bit here with this? So I want you to look at three things here, just, just for the last few minutes. Um, one is childlike, because I said that we had childlike wisdom. Uh, the other one is understanding, because I think that's critical that we grasp that. And the other one is wisdom. Understanding, childlike, and wisdom. If we can understand those three things, we might get somewhere. So, for some things to have any effect at all in our lives, there has to be a place that we have to be. So, in the same way for the brella to have an effect in my life, there's a place I have to be. Do you get that? It's, it's not, this is not rocket science. There's a place I have to be. And if I'm not in that place, the brella can be the best brella in the world. It can be the best underbrella in the world. But as far as the benefits of that being experienced and felt by me, it ain't going to happen because there's a place that I need to be. So I want you to grasp this right here and right now. For something to have any effect at all in our lives, there's a place we have to be. And that also includes in the context of wisdom affecting our lives. Okay, Understanding is not the conclusion of anything. And of course, understanding is an interesting word because it's made up of two words. The two words it's made up of are under and standing. 
So in order to understand, you have to stand under. If you don't stand under, you will never understand. And the reason you go through life not really understanding is not because of the lack of a clarity of explanation or the lack of a presence of something, but the unwillingness to stand under what it is that has been brought into your life. That's the underbrella. You have to stand under the underbrella to understand the work of the underbrella. Now, of course, the problem is we, again, because of the way society has developed, we don't like standing under anybody. And the problem is that equality, when I agree in, with equality, I am, I am a big advocate of equality. But within the context of equality, that's about how we view each other and how we treat each other. But in the context of life, life is not equal. It doesn't treat equally. It doesn't measure itself that way. And in equality, you still have to have authority, because if you don't have authority, everybody does what's right in their own eyes. So you can't make any order, because we all just decide what we think order is, and of course, order to me will be disorder to you, and order to you will be disorder to me. And we can't even then decide on what we think is truly right and what we think is wrong and what brings life and what brings death. And so actually, the equality doesn't create community. The, the equality creates disunity because we don't agree in our equality. So we have to be careful in the principle of equality that all men are equal in the sight of God, which I absolutely believe, and we treat each other with equal love and kindness and equal respect. In the context of that, if you only hold that, then you never stand under anything. You only ever stand with everything. So therefore, you'll never truly understand anything that is wisdom in the context of life because you're not prepared to stand under. You're so committed to retaining your individuality and your independence and your equality that you can't have the wisdom of wisdom because the wisdom of wisdom doesn't come from being equal. It comes from standing under. And when I'm willing to stand under... That's why in that first one we read about the fear of God wasn't about being frightened to God, but it's saying, I want to stand under someone and under something that can help me that's bigger than myself and outside of my own foolishness of when I measure myself against myself. So understanding means to stand under. It's the action of standing under. And it's not the conclusion of anything. It's simply the doorway to wisdom. See, some of you also think, if I could just understand, everything would be okay. But understanding is not the conclusion of anything. It's just the doorway to wisdom. When you're prepared to stand under something, so here's the wisdom that David stood under. If I had not believed, I would have fainted if I had not believed to have seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He, he's, he's, he stood under a belief that he would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, okay? And that became the doorway to wisdom, okay? Okay, so let's move on to talk about this childlike thing. There's a difference between childlike and childish. Childishness makes us impervious to wisdom. So every childish behavior that we embrace involve ourselves in makes us impervious to wisdom. You can't receive wisdom when you're being childish. All of us know that not when our children stop being childlike and start being childish, you can't get wisdom through to them. That's why they finish up in their room. As a lot of us in here, it would do us good to be sent to our room. Because of childishness, but we're not talking about childish wisdom, we're talking about childlike wisdom. There's a difference between childlike and childish. Childishness makes us impervious to wisdom. There will always be problems when people want to act in childish ways but be treated as adults. And that's happening all the time. Some of us, I'll say some of us, so nobody feels pointed out, could get a degree in that. Acting childishly but want to be treated as adults. The two don't go together. 
And that's part of the problem of the lack of wisdom in thinking that by acting childishly, we can be treated as adults. When actually, as we read earlier, you actually make that person wise in their own eyes if you don't point out the foolishness of that issue. Being a child has everything to do with age, but being childish doesn't. So being a child has everything to do with age, but being childish doesn't. You cannot stop being a child. You can't. You are born as a baby and you become a child and you can't stop being a child. You are a child for as long as you are a child, but you will grow out of it. You can't stop being a child, but you will grow out of it. You have grown out of being a child in the physical sense, but you cannot grow out of childishness in the same way. So we can stop being a child and grow out of being a child, but never grow out of childishness, which is the preventer to the wisdom that we often need to move to where we need to go. You can't grow out of childishness in the same way. That requires a conversion experience. You have to be converted from being childish, and I've got a verse to go with that in just a moment. So, mature is not something you are seen as, it's something you behave as. So there's too many of us, I want to be seen as mature. Well, maturity is not something you are seen as. Maturity is something you behave as. And then you don't need anybody to see you as, because it's obvious that you are. Because your behaviour shows that you are mature. So when we start wanting to be seen as mature, it's actually showing that we are not mature, but we're actually being childish that says, I want you to see me as mature. You have to see me as mature. I'm grown up. Yes, you've grown up from being a child, but you've not grown up from being childish. And so if that's you, and we've all been there, that requires a conversion experience. Childishness looks like this. Taking your ball home. And all these things can be applied to our relationships, to life, to friendships, to church. And I've seen it far too often. You take your ball home. I don't like that I'm taking my ball home. You know, I'm I'm, I'm in a huff. I'm going off in a huff. I'm taking my ball home. You understand that term, taking your ball home? comes from the days when you probably only had one football in all the estate. (laughs) And so whoever owned the ball controlled the game. And if the one who owned the ball got the hump then they would take their ball home. So there was, that's the colloquialism comes from that. They would take the ball home, then you couldn't play anymore because they'd taken the ball home because they were in a hump. That's what childishness looks like. And some of you do that. You do that in the group you're in. You do that in the ministry you're performing. You do that in the church. I'm not your friend anymore is another one. Or the other classic one that puts the blame on the other person. It's obvious you're not my friend anymore. That's the classic one. For those who are a little bit cleverer, you know, don't say you're not my friend. They say it's obvious you're not my friend anymore. That's childishness. Someone say something, I feel very strongly about this. One of the worst aspects of social media, particularly Facebook, is unfriend and block. See, what does unfriend say about you? Never mind, what does it say about the other person? It's what it's saying about you that I'm more bothered about. Because in my experience, what most people do is when they are acting childishly, the first action of their childishness is to unfriend everybody on Facebook who doesn't agree with the decision that they've made and block them. That's called childishness. And I'm going to tell you now, it's not acceptable as a kingdom believer, as a child of God. It's not acceptable. Now, if somebody's stalking you, if somebody's pursuing you for sexual favours, who shouldn't be, if somebody's threatening you and your family, by all means, unfriend them. But Jesus made friends of people. He didn't go around unfriending people. He went around friending people. And I don't think it's appropriate. So you've heard my heart on that. Okay, I'm giving you, I'm giving you my wisdom on that because I don't think it serves the purpose of the kingdom of God when we do those things. And that's part of our childishness. Of course, another part is uh, childishness looks like withholding self, possessions, resources. So I'm just not going to go. I'm just not going to turn up. I'm just not going to give. I'm just not going to give a tithe. That's childishness. Okay? Uh, Oh, of course, there's the Kevin the teenager one as well. I hate you. (laughs) Yeah, I hate you. 
You, and where does that come from? You never let me. I'm not allowed. You think this. You think that. I hate you. They're all expressions of childishness, okay? So if any of those are in you in various forms and little ways, whatever, that's not being childlike. That's being childish. And you need to have a conversion to get out of that because childlike is good. Childish is bad, okay? But childish is focused in the, in the, in the B2B, Childlike is focused in a bigger expression of understanding the world around us and what's required. So let's bring this thing through to its conclusion. Childishness always has a reason or an excuse for why it acts the way it does. And it will never take responsibility for its choices or actions. Now I know I'm going on a little bit about this because I think it's important. Childishness never takes responsibility for its choices or actions. It always blames someone or something else and therefore excuses it having the huff, taking its ball home, being in a mood, not talking, not responding, not texting back, whatever it is, always excuses it by the fact that it's someone else, because you won't take, we don't take responsibility for our actions. Now, taking responsibility for our actions and for our choices is a wonderful thing, because that opens the door to stand under something that brings wisdom, and that wisdom brings freedom. That's what I'm talking about, okay? So, also, childishness can't delineate between judgment and consequence. So, when you tell a childish person what the consequence of their actions will be, their immediate response is, you're judging me. Because childishness can't delineate between judgment and consequence, okay? Um, if, I, if, I, if I walk off the edge of a cliff and there's a thousand foot drop and I fall to my death, that is not a judgment upon me for my action. That is a consequence of my choice, Okay? And most of the things in our life, we've got to stop looking at them as judgments and understand their consequences and that we need to stand under something, get some wisdom, we'll be free. Enough said about that and, you know, beating this drum. Okay, so the true fullness and meaning of the kingdom of God is only entered and received by the childlike. Here's a verse, Matthew 18, verse 1 through 3. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? It's wonderful, isn't it, what was obsessing their thinking? All these amazing thoughts about winning the world and, and, and being in right relationship with God. and No, what was obsessing their thought? Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Equality, parallel. Who's the greatest among us? How can I rise? But he called a little child, had him stand among them, and said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children or childlike, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. There's something about being childlike that helps us enter the kingdom of heaven. And the greatest benefit of being childlike is illustrated here. He called a little child and had him stand among them. You see, calling a little child to stand in the middle of 12 big guys takes a certain kind of submission to a certain kind. You'd be in trouble for that today. If you've got a little child stood him in the middle of 12 grown men, you're going to be in serious problems. But the illustration here, it takes a certain standing under. It takes a certain willingness to appreciate other things and what is around and the impact that that might have to stand in the middle. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you be change and become into this childlike state, like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Or in other words, standing under is critical to our, our experiencing what the Bible calls the kingdom of heaven in the context of our life. Remember, if you don't stand under the underbrella, it can't brella for you, because you have to stand under it. The childlike have an understanding that is not driven by the cognitive process of rational thought. See, that child is not cognitively, rationally thinking through all the implications of responding to what Jesus asked him to do and standing in the middle of the group. He's not cognitively, rationally thinking that through. But by the trust to stand under a wisdom not yet possessed, it brings him to a rationale that validates the wisdom of that wisdom. Let me read that to you again. The childlike have an understanding that is not driven by the cognitive process of rational thought, but by the trust to stand under a wisdom not yet possessed, because that's the other part of the problem. 
If we don't have it right then and it doesn't work right then, we're not prepared to acknowledge that that was wisdom and that works. But wisdom doesn't work like that. You stand under it. It's a wisdom not yet possessed until the rationale validates the wisdom of that wisdom. Or in other words, down here, when you've listened to that wisdom, when you've stood under that wisdom, is when you get the fruit of that wisdom that always brings life. So Luke 7.35, nearly done. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. Now, of course, we are not born even as children. We are born as babies and we begin as embryos in the mother's womb. So by the time we become children, there has been a passage of time. Wisdom is not proved by an embryo. Wisdom is proved right by her children. Or in other words, when you will receive wisdom and stand under that which is wise and walk with that, it will produce a harvest like, like an embryo becomes a baby, becomes a child, and nobody can stop that process. You will be in a process that will always bring you to the place of life if you're willing to put yourself within the context of that wisdom. So let me finish with the last four things. Childlikeness in adulthood requires a conversion experience. Jesus said to the adults, unless you change and become, the other word used in some other versions is unless you are converted and become as this child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The lesson being most of us are prone to childishness and not childlikeness, and we need a conversion from childishness to childlikeness so that the gentleness of our spirit makes us willing to stand under something, and in the humility to stand under that, we receive the wisdom, and the wisdom's proved right by what it produces in our life, which is the children. Understanding is gained by standing under. So let me finish by saying this. Remember, for some things to have any effect at all in our lives, there's a place we have to be. Please learn that tonight. For some things to have any effect at all in your life, there's a place you have to be. That's why I like what David says. He said, he who dwells in the presence of the Most High, rests in the shadow of the Almighty. There's a place you need to be where it says, now I can say of the Lord, he's my refuge and strength. He is my health, he is my provision, he is my power. But you have to be in that position. So to think somehow by this craziness that if we just do our own thing, that we will always be under the benefit of the umbrella is stupid. Wisdom says you got to stand under. And I'm saying to some of you tonight, if you will stand under the wisdom of God, if you'll stand under the wisdom of the revelation of the kingdom, if you'll stand under some of the wisdom of people in here that can help you with your decisions, as you stand under that, you position yourself in the place where you will receive the benefit of that covering and that help. The wisdom of wisdom is yours for the taking but only when you see the need for an underbrella. If you don't see the need for an underbrella, wisdom is not yours for the taking. Does that affect God's love for you? Not at all. Does that affect God's grace to you? Not at all. Does that put you under judgment? Not at all. But what it does, it leaves you at the mercy of the consequences of a B2B life that enough was said at the beginning about the foolishness of that measurement that always leaves us in lack and in loss, but just like a baby grows into a child and wisdom only really shows itself when it's had the time to prove itself, stupidity and foolishness always only show up when they've had time to prove themselves and very often it's too late to go back and fix that. Thank God for the grace of God. Thank God for the love of God. Thank God for new beginnings. But tonight, I want you to stand under the umbrella. I want you to be aware there is an umbrella, And it's an umbrella because you're supposed to get under that umbrella. And when you get under that umbrella, there will be a wisdom that will invade your life that will allow you, as Jesus said, to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's a new place. It's a new thing. It's a new understanding. And it's available to you tonight. So don't be dumb don't be stupid. I want you to have the wisdom of wisdom in your life. Come under the umbrella. And I'm sure that if, if Rihanna were to rewrite that song now, 
It would be, you can stand under my umbrella, Ella. Ella. All right, let me pray for you. Father, you, you know every heart in here tonight. Uh, you, you know every motive, every intent. You know every desire. You know every quirk. You know every weakness. You know every fantasy. You know all of our stupidity. You know all of our foolishness. You know all of our weaknesses. You know all of our sins. You, you know all of our failings. But you also know that the kingdom is within us. You also know that you wired us inside to be more than we are, to become more than we have become, that we've already been hardwired inside for that connection that comes, but it ignites when we live under your wisdom, working in our lives. And as Paul said, when we don't conform to the pattern of this world, but we become transformed by the renewing of our mind to prove what is the, the good and perfect and acceptable will of God, the wisdom of God working in our lives, because we positioned ourselves under the umbrella. So I pray for every person in here tonight, Father, including me, that we'll shift our position, that, that where necessary, I pray for a conversion and a repentance and a conversion from our childishness. Lord, help us if we've done things that are childish. I, I just pray hearts will cry out to you now and just turn from that, recognize it, acknowledge it, get the truth of that childishness and have a conversion right now to be childlike, to see the kingdom of God produce a different result Amen. and a different experience. So thank you for your love and grace, Father, but help us to move into this position we've talked about and to understand the wisdom of wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I'm expecting us to be a community of people who are very wise, but not in our own eyes. But wise nevertheless. All right, we're going to pay it forward. Hope you're ready to do that now. So, uh, as we sing, be blessed. We love you. Grab a coffee after, talk to somebody. And uh, we'd love to see you on Wednesday night. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others. <laughs>